This is Noah Healy. I'm the founder of Cord Disc, and we're going to be exploring markets, economics, patents, and a little bit of math on the next episode of Prosperity. Now, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to yet another exciting episode of the Online Prosperity Show. I'm your host, Prosper Tarovinga, and today, We've got a guest who's about to take us on a mind-bending journey through economics and innovation. Now, Noah, how are you doing, my man? I'm doing great, Prosper. Thanks for having me here. Well, absolutely. The pleasure is all mine, and I can't wait to jump into this because uh, for those that are watching right now, get ready to meet Noah Healy, who is a market designer and a game theorist extraordinaire with a background in nuclear engineering and a stint in the technical world during the dot-com boom. Now, Noah's journey is nothing short of uh, fascinating, but hold on to your seats because he's not just about crunching numbers. He's literally revolutionizing the economic systems one concept concept at a time. Now get ready because I think this episode really promises to be one of the best roller coasters in insights we've never had on this show, um, you know, based on the people that we've had before. So no, I can't wait to jump into this. Could you maybe share with our audience a little bit about yourself and what led you, um, you know, to come from nuclear engineering to market design and game theory? Uh, sure. Well, basically, my first job uh, made that transition. I got a job uh, working for a company and had to start learning about computers. And once you start, uh, there's a there's a very deep level of mathematics that underlies how computers and programming languages function. And I started reading those papers and found it quite beautiful. So at this point, it's been a bit over a decade ago. Uh, I had I had finished off with the company I was working with, and I had some money, and so I effectively decided to build my own sabbatical and take some time out for myself to really get deep thinking about new ideas in information and communication, and that's where. That's where my current work, where I actually found an innovation using game theory as an approach to communication, which happens to have pretty significant economic implications. Fantastic. And um, that's a long ride. I mean, the dot-com era produced, um, you know, what we now know as Amazon and all the other big sort of tech companies. What was... What was life like in those days? Um, because what we hear is a lot of people talking about the gold rush, you know. What was it like, you know, living in the in that sort of era where internet was just getting started? Uh there was there was a lot of reinventing the wheel going around, and uh there's also a great deal of confusion. Uh the company I first worked for out of college, for example, happens to be a pioneer in the social gaming space. Unfortunately, since there was no social gaming space and they did not understand themselves to be pioneers in the social gaming space, they built a revenue model that turned out to be completely incompatible with their user base. And so they ran out of money and couldn't keep going. Uh, so there's, there's quite a lot of that. Uh, one of the things I find most interesting is that most of the successes that come out of there, and there's a handful of exceptions, but not as many as one might believe, are actually using very primitive business models that they're then just using computers and the internet to scale up. So you mentioned Amazon, for example. Amazon's business model was essentially identical to the business model that Sears had already very successfully turned into a national chain. Uh, but Amazon was able to not have to spend nearly as much money on clerks and order fillers and internal accountants and so on, because computers will do that work for you. Uh, and Sears was unable to 
reform itself so that they didn't need that those personnel and were just unable to price compete uh with with that juggernaut um the the people moving into new spaces uh many of them were basically insane uh and the ones that weren't in many cases they they had fundamental misapprehensions about what their value propositions actually were so you had this mix of crazy ideas and good ideas that were sort of solving the wrong problem uh with with sort of very basic ideas that were just taking advantage of the technology and and going for a ride Absolutely. I quite like that. And, you know, the the comparison that you have with, you know, brick and mortar sort of businesses and the online sort of space, the difference is obviously in the labor that is involved and also the expenses and rentals and things of that nature, because with Amazon, they have infinite space and with Sears, they had to pay per square meter and everything else. And um, while you were talking, I was just thinking Walmart has a greeter. But uh, Amazon just has an email and you can imagine you can send that email over and over, you know, just reminding people to pay up their subscription, whereas a greeter needs to be paid every single month. And maybe on the day that they're not there might actually affect, um, you know, the, the turnover of the business for that particular day. Now, you've then moved on and started developing game theoretic you know strategies you you into podcasting yourself and you're also deploying uh you know energetic serendipity with the work that you are working on and all of these to you know the untrained person sound like very fascinating approaches to business growth could you maybe elaborate how you've actually used these strategies to start your curving the path of what you're working on right now uh absolutely so effectively my path is being compelled by these strategies uh i got into this originally just because i was interested in having mostly interesting things to think about uh but also some desire for those interesting things to have practical utility and i was not expecting to run across anything this of this magnitude um what wound up happening was I wrote a piece of code based on these discoveries. And when I load tested that code, I discovered that it would be capable of operating markets that could take over for, at that point, half of the uh, existing global uh, deal flow load. Uh, and of course, computers have gotten faster in the last decade. So the, the laptop I'm currently on running that code could actually handle all of the deal flow load of the entire financial system in the commodity space. So when you're when you're dealing with an advantage that's that large, that becomes extremely compelling. Um, and while the risk of going after such a huge target is is quite big as well, one of the historical qualities of the commodity space is that the markets actually have this tendency to uh, very successfully compete with one another if they have these lower costs. So it's this combination of having a system that only needs a small toehold and then it can sort of carry itself out, uh, leading to my kind of energetic serendipity strategy where I'm trying to cast as broad a net as possible with as few commitments in any particular direction as possible um, so that I'm just continually open to opportunities to get the ball rolling um, because there's sort of an avalanche like character once once a ball starts rolling anywhere um, uh, there, there's not a there's not much in the way of a necessary second step or follow-up. A, a customer base, if it can be established, will become self-loyal because the system is offering them such an improvement in their economic outlook. 
Oh, absolutely. And, you know, with the advances we've now had in communication and technology, it's actually driven markets to speed up. And as you say, your laptop right now can actually facilitate all those, um, you know, trades or, you know, transactions just from the comfort of your own home. And I think modern computers have actually pushed that those levels to, you know, fundamentally alter the behavior of marketplace, um, you know, information. But we've also heard that in the line of you creating all of this, you've now encountered quite a unique challenge with the U.S. Uh, patent office. Um, you care to share a bit more about this sort of unprecedented set of uh, refusals that you're currently facing? Uh, absolutely. So I started the patent process in 2015. Uh, and after a few attempts to come up with objections, all of which failed, uh, they ex they granted me a notice of acceptance in 2019. Uh, they proceeded to ignore that notice of acceptance, which is not really something that they have a a procedure for doing. Uh, and then they came up with a brand new objection, which was completely specious. Uh, in in essence, they claimed that the numbers one and two were the same thing. Uh, they claimed it in a somewhat complicated manner, but the math is is something that I'm actually good at. And so I was able to find the very well-known and respected mathematical papers that point out just exactly how divergent the, the claims that they were making were from reality. And so in 2021, they were forced to admit that they, in fact, had no leg to stand on. And they re they issued me a second note of his acceptance and then three weeks later they issued a second retraction uh, or actually a first retraction of my second notice of acceptance because they still were just ignoring the first one entirely uh and uh and then about a month later um brought forth their reasons this time which uh in personal communication with my attorneys the the people that wrote this said we've just been told to do this by people we can't understand. So this doesn't make any sense because we don't, we don't agree with it and we don't have anything sensible to say. Uh, I did open up a case with my congressional office to try to learn more about what was going on. Um, and they also got an unprecedented response. Uh, they got a form letter with the timeline that left out the first notice acceptance entirely. Uh, followed by a kind of knuckle rap telling the telling the congressional office to mind their own business because the patent office would only communicate on any manner through a single channel. Um, now, my congressional office, uh, you know, they they put in requests to the bureaucracy in various channels in a wide variety of ways, and I happen to know for a fact because at one of their, you know, sort of public working events, the guy who was working with uh, a case agent in front of me in line was also dealing with the patent office. They've never had the patent office tell them that they reject congressional questions before. Uh, so uh, nobody really knows what's going on, uh, except for people who apparently are not allowed to be talked about. Uh, I... Uh, I worked with my attorneys to put together a appeal case and that appeal case was scheduled uh, last July um, for July of 2025. So uh, it will be about a year and a half uh, before the patent office is forced to answer for their current claims. Um, those claims are self-contradictory again, uh, but I don't know what will happen uh, at that point. Mm, and um, well, good luck with that battle, because I think you've stumbled upon something that the powers that may be might not want surfacing. And um, what, what do you what do you sort of think is going to be the outcome of all of this once it's all said and done? Or what are you hoping uh, it should be? I, I very much hope that uh, I'll be able to move forward 
with this uh, in hand, uh, I have started a petition to help people spread the word and, and raise awareness about this particular issue. Uh, but yeah, this this there very definitely seems to be some entity involved that is standing athwart uh, that this and 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 attempting to stop it. And wh whatever that entity is, uh, apparently has no reasons to give to anybody for why they're doing it. Um, this technology is potentially extremely disruptive to some of the wealthiest people on earth. Uh, but it also greatly enhances the capacity of economies. Uh, I was talking to a another Australian podcast just a few months ago and uh, looking at uh, just some online figures on what uh, the Australian commodity production uh, budget looks like and what commodity tra overhead trade looks like the general adoption of this technology would be worth something on the order of $27 billion a year uh, to the Australian economy, uh, which is pretty non-trivial uh, for, for you guys. Absolutely. And maybe, I don't know, have you beefed up your security? Because if you're going to be trading on things like that, um, you don't want to be a commodity in all of this, um, you know, wrangle that might be happening. Uh, well, my basic approach to security is to be very public and open about everything. So this system uh, needs somebody to stand up and launch in any given jurisdiction. Uh, that is not an inexpensive proposition, which is why I'm not doing it, because I don't have enough money for it. Uh, but the there's code sitting on github that will do the basic computations today uh the white paper is public and is sitting on my linkedin page and is open for download on my website uh so this is this is a technology that could be deployed at quite literally any time by pretty much any financial institution on earth um and and it's simply up to them whether they wish to provide a useful service for more money than they currently make or whether they want to stick with the status quo. To date, virtually all of them have chosen sticking with the status quo. Absolutely. I mean, obviously, if there is this big thump that is not, uh, you know, budging in order for this to come to play, then obviously they they must know a thing or two about what this would look like for them. Now, who stands to benefit if this patent goes out and this technology now becomes available? Uh, basically, there's a few different phases. The, the very first people that benefit are the people that implement the marketplace and the producers in the marketplace. So right now, uh, commodity market operation, it absorbs a pretty tiny fraction of the overall transaction costs. Transaction fees are quite low, and they represent a relatively small amount of the actual cost involved in the difference between the price seen by the person taking delivery and the price seen by the person making delivery. Uh, so to put some numbers on that, in the United States, the the total overhead is in the neighborhood of a trillion dollars. The market, the primary market operator in Chicago has an annual revenue of around $4 billion. So they're getting less than half a percent of the revenue uh, of the potential sort of re addressable revenue of their space. Uh, this kind of a system would allow an operator such as that to 10x their revenue while reducing the overhead cost by 90% at the same time. Uh, and so that kind of that kind of competitive advantage is is pretty extreme. Uh, that that second part, the producers, uh, any reduction in transaction costs goes directly to the producer's bottom line. So whereas today, globally speaking, about $1.06 uh, gets used up making the deal, 
if that drops to say one dollar and twelve, then that would be an eight percent increase in revenues across the board uh, for commodity operators that generally have a say. 12 to 15 percent margin that would represent a 50 to 66 percent improvement in their profits uh which is obviously extreme um however in the medium term as production becomes radically more profitable and more people get into production prices will moderate in order to attract greater demand and at that point the consumers the people that are taking delivery will begin to benefit as the quality and and quantity of the base materials that we use for you know food clothing and energy uh become more ubiquitous and less expensive i i can imagine i mean as a result of all the advantage uh, advances that we now have in technology and the speed of transactions in, in, in the marketplace that we are now in, this, this has become a global, you know, village. There's a need for new sort of logical and, and, and ways of people to exchange in these markets and provide the stability of all these different currencies and safety and also at a low cost in, in, in all this price discovery. Now, in a, is there a way that, you know, ordinary people can actually maybe assist or help in putting this in place? Or is it a battle that you just have to fight with the higher ups? Uh, so the higher ups are obviously much more useful because they can make things go. But I have quite recently started a petition uh, and would very much like to encourage people to go check it out and, you know, sign or support if you can, uh, because, large numbers actually can move these things around. Um, uh, there have been a number of fintech companies that essentially just built a, a large amount of public goodwill and were able to use that alone to secure the funding required to, to move them forward. So uh, while the patent is, is, or the petition is bringing uh uh, pressure around the patent uh signatures from around the world are very much appreciated uh and i've received support from other countries as well and that kind of that kind of movement can create a grassroots push for this sort of thing to to come into being absolutely now speaking of you know global reach and global signatures is is something that you could maybe pick to patent in a different country that's that's just not the united states uh i could have attempted to pursue that um however uh once again as part of energetic serendipity i don't want to overcommit and so uh while the united states has sort of well actually the biggest sort of single uh uh legal domain uh block of of commodity exchange uh the rest of the world is actually open source so i'd mentioned that there's code up on github it's under a creative commons license that's at there's about seven different levels of creative commons license and this one is at a level that uh forces it to continue on to other people that you know take and modify the code uh, but is superseded by the patent. Uh, now, the patent only has force inside the United States and its environs. So people in other countries are actually perfectly free to take that code uh, and run with it under that license. And as long as they're not operating inside the United States, they'll remain forever free from my patent. So for those who would prefer patent protection, I'm pursuing that inside the United States for those who might prefer operating on their own or operating outside of patent protection that's available in the other countries of the world. Right. So who are the people that you want to rally around? Um, is it just commodity exchange uh, developers or people that are trying to offer new ways to conduct global trade? Like who would you rather 
um, be listening to this and actually helping you move this forward? Uh, I, well, once again, I'm I am not in a position to turn down help from any quarter. So anyone who wishes to be rallied, I'm I'm up for rallying. But for those who want to build their own exchanges, um, uh, it's different at different levels. So at the national scale, you really do need to be a an accredited financial institution, uh, uh, essentially a a a regional bank or 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 better uh at sort of mid-scale uh kind of broker dealer types of of financial transaction facilitators could could move in and take take this on um if you're operating at an extremely local level and you just like to uh create a sort of mini market for things like uh, you know, volunteer goods or recycling materials or locally sourced foods, those those sorts of things operate at such low uh, margins and so such low total valuations that in many jurisdictions, basically anybody can do it. Um, so in those cases, uh, kind of like nonprofit organizers, uh, those sorts of those sorts of people uh, might be able to to exploit the technology. Mm. I mean, obviously, you've been at it ever since, like you say, 2016, when you started the um, filing. 20, 2015 was the beginning of filing. 2016 was the full patent filing. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I essentially filed a provisional so that I could talk to people so I could find an attorney to work with and managed to get in just under the wire. I think we had about two days to spare. Uh, before my provisional was going to run out, before we got the the full patent application in, absolutely. And um, well, it's it's been a a journey all in in itself because um, if you look at it, this has been eight years in the making, and you know, obviously, you're trying to bring in a lower cost, a less risky, a less gameable, higher return uh, redesign for commodity markets. Now, just reflecting on your journey so far, what has been the most rewarding aspect of your work, um, you know, as a market designer and a game theorist? Because there's got to be something that keeps you in the ring. Somebody would have given up by now. Uh, well, the thing that keeps me in the ring is the thing that got me into the ring. The mathematics says that this is the most economically valuable activity for human beings to engage in. And as long as the rest of you aren't going to do it, um, it's it's down to me. So I'm in. Mm, fantastic. Well, at the end of the day, I mean, there's so much that we can unravel in all of this and things of that nature. Is Do you have the links or where can people get information on how to get, um, you know, behind what you're, you're working on right now? Uh, absolutely. So there's a bunch of different links. Uh, you can reach out to me. I have an email, noahphealy at yahoo.com. I have my LinkedIn, Noah Healy there. Uh, I've got a website, Cordisc, C-O-R-D-I-S-C. Uh, there's a white paper that you can download. I'll, I'll send you a link for that. Uh, I have a podcast where I talk about the AI developments and their implications for society in general with the former Reddit CTO uh, called uh, The Fourth Age, the AI Revolution. Uh, we just dropped our 11th episode yesterday. Uh, and there is, again, the petition. It's up on change.org and it's under all caps CDM. Uh, that's my acronym for coordinated discovery markets, all cap CDM underscore all lowercase patent. Absolutely. I'll make sure that all those links are in the show notes below. I mean, if you really uh, look at the date, you know, June the 2nd, 2016, and um, obviously you just filed in your patent and you got that patent number, Excitement is in the air, only to discover that you now had eight years of fighting for it to actually come to life. What sort of piece of advice would you give to, um, you know, people that are going to be going on the journey that you are on, just knowing what you know now about business, life, and <laughs> everything else that might actually just come to 
show you what's real and what's not? Uh, networking, 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 networking. Uh, it's it really is who you know, um, and it's very difficult to leverage what you know into who you know. So um, uh, make those connections uh, early and often. Uh, and and just just push them as much as you can. Absolutely, fantastic. Now, obviously, with all this happening, uh, all we can do is uh, wish you all the best, uh, and hopefully, something turns with what you are trying to create. Because this CDM, if you are going to fight for it to exist, either yourself or the people that you've networked with will do their best uh, to bring it to to, to light and um, things of that nature. What else can we expect from you? Because you're obviously uh, not just sitting here waiting for the patent office. You know, you're creating, you are into game design and um, all these other things that you are, um, you know, looking into. What what What's next for Noah? Uh, well, I am fairly concentrated on this. Uh, my hobby is recreational mathematics, and I've mentioned several times before, I'm rather interested in the computational properties of the Euclidean plane these days. Uh, I'm still trying to learn more about the nature of continuity, uh, and, uh, and I keep trying to bounce off of Lie algebras. Absolutely. And for those that know what all of that is, I bet they will be geeking out with you um you know and seeking you out so that they can connect with you i can't thank you enough for the time that we spent on the show today i mean obviously there's so much that could be unraveled but this is a concept and an idea that is um of a specific sort of knowledge set and um so many people you know would want to know a lot more so i would definitely put those um links in the show notes so that people can look at the petition look at your website and things of that nature and uh there you have it folks what a ride it's been with uh, noah healy i mean from nuclear reactors to marketplaces we've explored it all and um if you really want to dive deep into the world of market design and game theory i encourage you to rewatch this episode and uh, yeah, share it with other people that might actually uh, find this valuable because this coordinated discovery market system really needs to be out there so we can radically improve price discovery and maximize commodities trade volume all at market clearing prices. So I'm hoping that uh, what Noah is working on is something that is needed in the marketplace and um, hopefully those that are trying to stop it from coming to play are not going to win and Noah's, um, you know, battle is going to be the one that succeeds. And don't forget to subscribe uh, on the Online Prosperity uh, Show because you never know what mind-expanding insights you might come across, um, you know, in this instance. This is something that a lot of people might not be aware of, but now you know there's something like this um, going on. Until next time, this has been Prosper.